you're going yes there you go uh we're going to hear a a talk a book launch of some description by danny white danny widener um i'll tell you more about him in a minute but the talk is entitled third world within possible histories of solidarity and struggle um and to give you a big flavor of who danny is Danny is, he says that he makes ends meet by teaching history at the University of uh, California, San Diego, where he's also interim director of the program in Global South Studies. He's the author of Black Arts, West Culture and Struggle in Post-War Los Angeles, which is a very excellent book. Um, I remember getting a personalized copy yes. in Portugal. Um, and the forthcoming Third World Within Multi-Ethnic Movements and Transnational Solidarity, which is out in April. Since two, 2022, he's also served as director of UC San Diego's Institute of Arts and Humanities. And he's also a member of the Pillars of Community, a San Diego-based organization that advocates for communities and people negatively impacted by law enforcement and the punishment of the system. So Danny, over to you, bro. Thank Thanks, you so much. Man. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I feel quite um, grateful and honored to be here. So. Um, this is kind of a talk in two parts. The first part gives a little bit of a framing of um, the broader concerns of the book by using uh, the 19th century in California as a point of departure for thinking about the relationship between race and the formation of capitalism in the United States. Um, pivots around a kind of question of the production of racial difference and then goes into a more contemporary discussion of one manifestation of that and the activist response um, to that moment. So that's like a little bit of an overview of the arc of the talk. Um, I should say that by training, I'm really a historian of social movements. Uh, and then I came to the study of history largely um, through dual routes. My father was a history teacher, um, but my parents came out of an activist space. They were involved in early police monitoring projects in Los Angeles. Uh, and a variety of other struggles in 1950s and 60s. And so I was raised essentially um, in the hopes that a kind of systematic transformation would take place in the United States. Uh, I hold on to that hope, but I now have been waiting most of my adult life. Um, and so I, as John said, I'm making ends meet temporarily till the revolution comes, teaching history, um, and then hopefully I'll find something more productive to do with the back nine of my life. Um, so let me just jump in there and I'll say, I'm gonna read a little bit, but not too much um, of the intro to the book. Oh, there we go. All right, my finger was too light. One morning in 1934, the Sacramento Bee published a biography of longtime Oroville resident, John Widener. For those people who don't know where Orville is, probably, hopefully, everybody, you may know where San Francisco is. If you know where San Francisco is, you may know where Sacramento is. It's the capital of the state of California. Oroville <laughs> is to the north and slightly to the east of Sacramento. So we're talking about that kind of north central part of the state of California. The Orville Negro, as the paper referred to the 78-year-old man, had come to California as a baby and enslaved. Arriving from Missouri in 1856, during the waning days of the gold rush, the infant Widener and his mother had been brought west by an owner intent on striking it rich, though preferably through the labor of others. Amid the declining prospects faced by individual miners, confronted with the increasing adoption of capital intensive forms of hydraulic mining. So, you know, if you are in the United States, typically, and you see a representation of a gold miner, It'll look like the guy on the right, although there are plenty of people like the man on the left. Um, but that's a really short phase of the gold rush. It becomes um, much like this much more quickly. So <laughs> this is the context. Uh, <clears throat> after the, Amidst the declining prospects faced by individual miners confronted with the increased adoption of capital intensive forms of hydraulic mining, John's mother was hired out by her owner, as were many enslaved black migrants to California. After more than a year cooking and cleaning in Nevada City Hotel, Mother Widener negotiated the purchase of freedom for herself and her son. As was the case for all black Californians in antebellum America, their freedom was both precious and precarious. At least one no local newspaper felt comfortable publishing an advertisement for the sale of indenture 
black women. And the sight of kidnappers openly roaming the streets of Sacramento and San Francisco terrorized African-Americans and vexed the state's abolitionist whites. Even those who could legally document their own freedom ran the risk of enslavement. Despite the expiration of California's fugitive slave law in 1855, federal legislation combined with the inability of non-white people to testify in court meant that any dark-skinned foreigner, child, mulatto, Negro, or Indian could be seized by three or four rogues. Although California joined the United, Nation, the United States as a free state in 1850, Tens of thousands of pro-slavery whites rushed west to look for gold. So what happens in terms of California, when California is admitted, it's the 31st state, and it's going to disrupt permanently the balance by which a slave state is added at the same time a free state is added. So the, the decision about whether California will be a free state or a slave state is really one of the precipitating causes of the American Civil War. As many as 1,500 enslaved people entered the state with them. On the eve of statehood, Southern-born whites constituted more than a third of California's white population, and both the legislature and the judiciary reflected their influence. Fear of competition from Black workers dominated attitudes among those whites opposed to slavery, who repeatedly sought to write into the California Constitution prohibitions on the entry or residency of all people of African descent, regardless of status. And I should say here that um, there's a kind of notion of a Southern exceptionalism in American history. And it's something that I think gets absorbed sometimes outside when we learn patchwork the history of the United States, that anti-Black racism is first and foremost a problem of the South and those areas where enslavement had existed. So it's important to understand that places like Oregon, Illinois, Indiana, tried hard to prevent free Black people from coming into those states. It was against the law, for instance, for free Black people to come to the state of Oregon, which is pretty far north. Um, in any event, against this backdrop of hostility, kidnapping, and non-existent legal protection, hundreds of California's Black residents moved to British Columbia, having concluded that actual freedom was impossible for Black people anywhere between the Canadian and Mexican borders. My great-great-grandfather stayed in California, however, and he spent the next eight decades as a fixture in the towns that document, that dot the Sacramento Valley. Now I'm gonna mention a whole bunch of places nobody's ever heard of. From Chico and Oroville to Winters, Gridley, Woodland, Fair Oaks, and Yuba City. These would be villages if we had villages in the United States. Records reveal a circuitous lifetime of working class jobs. Bill Poster, janitor, boot black, scavenger, miner, laborer, cook. Like so many people of color, he entered the historical record largely because of his association with a famous white person. In naming the white John Bidwell, but not the black John Widener, the Sacramento Bee indicates its true subject with a headline that reads, Oroville Negro, born a slave, recalls Bidwell. Columnist Tom Arden's sketch traced John Widener's impressions of his one-time employer, a celebrated pioneer who played a key role in the gold rush. This guy, John Bidwell, um, is the man who's the <laughs> business manager on the farm where gold is actually discovered. Uh, Arden's calm made no mention of Widener's role in the AME church or his leadership in pioneering political organizations like the California Colored Citizens Convention and the Afro-American League. Also unmentioned by the B were John's children, Sherman, Oscar, Robert, and Annie, as well as Henrietta, his wife. In contrast to John, nobody brought Henrietta to California. Her ancestors had lived in the Sierra foothills and valley meadows of the Feather River watershed since Earth Initiate and Turtle had joined together to spread land across a world of water. Like many native Californians, Henrietta's people who live in a riverside village close to Table Mountain, so where we live originally is um, in this area around Orville, there's a big dam there, and there's kind of like a natural phenomenon. It's a mesa, and that was where the, this particular village was. We named ourselves as people, the eventual names by which they would be known to outsiders, the Northwestern Maidu, Konkau, spelled various different ways, were Anglo transliterations of a place-based name, Koyomkawi, as the Konkau Valley was called by those living there. 
that spoke to the centrality of place in ordering indigenous conceptions of the world. The Concow lived in one of the most densely settled places, parts of native California, where as one elder put it, you go two ridges away and they talk different. Reciprocity and relationality shaped an environment characterized by material stability, cultural complexity, um, and although governed by longstanding traditions, this is a dynamic world incorporating fire-based land management, extensive food diversity, and territories that were delineated um, around ours and the spaces of um, neighboring tribes. So we're talking about this area right here, Sacramento is kind of right in here, and you have the mountain Maidu, Yana people, Nisenen. So this is a kind of pre-colonial, um, pre-Columbian map. This is, I'll just kind of talk you through instead of reading it. Um, so what you have with the Maidu people, the Maidu, the Concow, the Nisenen, and the Machupta up in here, when somebody dies, their possessions are burnt. So there's a internal cultural pattern that prevents the accumulation of surplus and the um, production of hereditary forms of social inequality. So this is a kind of structure that's gonna prevent um, the emergence of feudalism out of a tribal structure. <clears throat> In any event, political authority within villages was decentralized and impermanent and conflict with neighbors while endemic was generally small scale. Within a world shaped by kinship and place, one thing that mattered little to Konkau people were the yellow nuggets that periodically washed up into creek beds. Gold brought strangers though, and strangers brought disaster. Invaders introduced new diseases, depleted game and other food sources and polluted waterways. The threat of violence at the hands of whites made the gathering of acorns, this is a food staple, and other plants highly dangerous activity. Murder was common, rape even more so. Should say something there, you know, after the removal to the reservations, what you find are investigations where on some of these reservations, upwards of 60, 70, 80% of people have uh, syphilis, gonorrhea, and other venereal diseases. So when we talk about the destruction of indigenous people through disease, I think there's often an assumption that we're talking about smallpox and it's something that is kind of more or less accidental and it's a bummer and people didn't have the antibodies and that's why they died. That's true in many contexts. And in the case of California, we're talking about um, a lot of diseases that include diseases that um, people encounter, let's just say, um, not that way. Thousands of adults were killed and their children were forced into domestic servitude as wards in a process given legal cover through the adoption in 1850 of an act for the government and protection of Indians. Then as now, links between vigilantism and state violence were clear to see. Localities paid cash for every dead body while the federal government offered land grants to veterans of campaigns lasting more than two weeks. Military officials, including Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, so this is gonna be the president of the Confederacy, right? Um, he's in California training people arming them, overseeing the payment of these bounties, um, provided professional training and advanced equipment to California state militiamen. Between 1846 and 1873, federal officials paid more than $1.7 million in cash bounties to the murderers of people whose primary crime was that white folks found them inconvenient. Like my African ancestors, my Indian people sought escape from forced labor at the hands of whites. And like Africans, Indian people had prices put on their heads. White American settlers transformed existing practices of labor coercion pioneered by the Spaniards and Californios, realizing new profits by selling captains as, quote, indentures rather than, quote, simply seizing Indians for their own use. Historian Benjamin Madley identifies 1862, the year my great-great-grandmother Henrietta was born as the peak of the practice of murdering California Indian adults in order to kidnap and sell young women and children for a profit. Born around 1836, Henrietta's mother Polly, her brother Henry, her sister Rosa and her brother John survived years of near unimaginable violence when more than 80% of California's indigenous population perished. At the behest of settlers, federal officials dispatched soldiers, uh, and militiamen who removed Concow, Maidu, and Pitt River people first to a short-lived coastal reservation and 
having decided that the coastal redwoods were too valuable to a mountainous area of Mendocino County that eventually became the Round Valley Reservation. Stop and just say something about this. This is a map of the removal. So Chico is another town. This is a valley right in here. And then once you get to Piscenza, you're going through the mountains. So there's two mountain ranges here into um, Mendocino County. And so uh, what happens if you go over this today, you'll see like um, these vast areas where the forest is burned. Can they hear me if I preserve oh, it? They can't see you. They can't oh. see your map. They can see the map. And they can hear my voice. So we're gonna we'll fake it till we make it. All right, so I'll go back over here and just say that um, you see really two things when you walk this route. The tribe um, does a commemorative walk every September on the anniversary of the removal. It takes you from Chico to Covalo, which is where the Round Valley Reservation is. Um, so you're cruising through these mountains, you see burn areas. And then you see fire camps. The fire camps are maintained by uh, the Department of Corrections. So John mentioned that one of the organizations I work with does a lot of stuff around um, police violence and uh, mass incarceration in California. And two of the folks who work in the organization with me, I was telling them, yeah, I'm going on the walk to the Round Valley Covalo. And the guy said, oh, yeah, I was in fire camp three, which is right about here. And another dude said, yeah, I was in camp five, which is right about here. So you see climate change manifested as mass forest fires. You see the prison industrial complex in California. And then you see areas of green. And those areas of green are typically um, illegal cannabis plantations. So in California, we have legal recreational cannabis. But there's a mass um, market for illegal grows. And those grows typically will have um, undocumented workers in them, Vietnamese, Chinese, Mexican, um, overseen by you know, heavily armed, basically plantation owners. And um, I won't tell the whole story because we're recording and things are getting broadcast, but I have a friend who um, has a relative who was murdered there. And it had to do with the cannabis industry. And um, I'll just let, we talked about it maybe, maybe more in the Q&A, but it's a completely lawless area. And so um, if you're interested in this pretty good book that just came out by a woman named Catherine Reed called Settler Cannabis, and it goes through how the history of gold and then timber and then weed production um, affect both the physical sites and the people who live there. So I'm jumping all around a little bit, um, but let me say, in the original removal, which took place at John Bidwell's ranch in Chico, to the Round Valley Reservation, 461 people left and 277 arrived alive. In this context, survival was a victory. Albert Hurtado wrote of how, quote, the grisly statistics of population reduction have overwhelmed students of California Indian history in ways that have left as a footnote the resilience and determination of native people. As Willie Bauer demonstrates, the displaced built new lives, incorporating the coming of whites into traditional stories, transforming reservation Christianity, entering the labor force as wage workers, uh, renewing ceremonies, and otherwise making Round Valley a home. For others, as David Chang shows, the exercise of choice consisted precisely in electing not to move to Round Valley. These survivors found kinship and intimacy among others, including Kanaka Maoli, other indigenous nations, or in Henrietta, John, Rosa, and Polly's case, freed African people in and around the Sierras. Fight and flight, negotiation and cultural persistence, kinship and creativity. These were forms of resistance equally familiar to enslaved Africans and indigenous Americans threatened with extinction. Recalling them is vital for it makes us subjects of our own history rather than the history of a, the objects of a history written by someone else. So let me, I'll just start to pivot there a little bit and say the story of John and Henrietta raises the first core concern of the book, which is the political excavation of historic interactions among communities of color. Jack Forbes argued that understanding the conquest of the Americas necessitated placing the experiences of Americans, and by this he meant indigenous people throughout the hemisphere, and Africans into a common frame. 
Doing so requires acknowledging the high degree of intermixture between the two, as well as a political economy of plunder that pillaged black lives and indigenous lands, but predominantly the presence of mixed communities, nations, and families. It's likewise important to acknowledge how sources move, especially official languages, move between defining native people as Indian, colored, mulatto, and black. This was our experience. To the Office of Indian Affairs officials who oversaw the allotment of Round Valley, I should say, the Office of Indian Affairs predates the Bureau of Indian Affairs. The names get used interchangeably for quite some time. Allotment was an effort to um, instruct indigenous people in private property. So communal lands were broken up into individual familial sized plots. It's a separate thing we could talk about, but there's a perennial fear in the United States on the part of the political right that the communal land holding patterns of native people constitute a primitive form of socialism and have to be moved against. Otherwise the example becomes a bad example for other people who don't own <laughs> land communally. To the Office of Indian Affairs folks who oversee the allotment of Round Valley, we were diggers. Digger is a pejorative term for California Indians, reflects supposedly the cultural um, primitivism of us as a people. For the racists living in and around the areas where I spent my summers growing up, we weren't diggers, we were something that rhymes with that, right? And so this is a 1982, uh, anti-Klan and neo-Nazi march in the town of Oroville. It's one of these places that had a rise of a particularly onerous far right. This is a 1980s moment where the kind of old Klan begins to establish its links with the neo-Nazi movement. People like David Duke, Tom Metzger, who's based in California, and that kind of um, white Aryan resistance that becomes a transitional moment in the history of the American far right on the way to the more contemporary uh, militia and kind of armed right movement. So we went back and forth between our um, description as native people and our um, description as African people. And this is not just true of my family as a whole. If you go to the town of Chico, which is a uh, traditional land of the Machupta, there's a Cal State University campus there. You go to the Indian Cemetery, which is across the street from the football stadium. Half of the names in the native ceremony are Hawaiians because the royal family of Maui, when it fled Kamehameha's unification of the island, a number of them came um, to California as gold seekers. They were captured by the army and moved to the reservation also. They wrote Kamehameha V, said, yeah, get us out of here. The soldiers have put us on this reservation. It's crazy. Um, and you can see these folks who are buried in the cemetery, who are both Kaun Kaun Maidu and Kanaka Maoli. So we're talking about a place in the 19th century that throws together um, all of these racialized communities. And it's the effect of US racial capitalism on these communities that's the second theme of the book. John and Henrietta lived firsthand both primitive accumulation and industrial capitalism at breakneck pace and amidst furious violence. They married just a few months before Marx wrote his friend Victor Sorge to ask for an update on economic conditions in California. Give me something meaty, Marx said. California is very important for me because nowhere else has the upheaval most shamelessly caused by capitalist centralization taken place with such speed. John Widener's introduction to Concow people came at the Chico Rancheria owned by John Bidwell, where my great grandfather worked as a servant as a teen and where many Concow and Machupta people moved to escape the violence swirling around them. Bidwell played a critical role in California's early Anglo history, working as a business manager on the farm where the gold rush began, serving in Congress during reconstruction, and pioneering the commercial production of melons, raisins, almonds, and walnuts, some of California's most important agricultural crops. In keeping with Cedric Robinson's view that capitalism emerged not as a revolutionary break from feudalism, but as part of an evolutionary process that betrayed strong links with its feudal past, Don Juan Bidwell passed himself in the manner of other Californians, adopting Spanish pretensions, acquiring Mexican land grants, and styling himself, like his one-time employer John Sutter, as patriarch, priest, father, and judge to the indigenous people on whose land his initial wealth was built. These guys are really amazing. They're English speakers. They're white Anglo-Americans. 
but they write each other in Spanish. They dress like mariachis and um, they have this whole kind of um, performance of Spanishness that is a way for them to cement themselves as a kind of transitional ruling class between the older Mexican Spanish California ruling class and this emergent industrial capitalist class. So they kind of have a foot in both worlds where the face they present toward other Anglo-Americans is a Spanish speaking face where they say, you know, we're before you. Um, but then of course they're displacing this same um, Spanish Mexican ruling class through intermarriage um, and taxation. Although recalled mostly as a so-called pioneer, Bidwell was among the most influential capitalists in California. A one-time ally and eventual rival of Leland Stanford, that's the guy who the university is named after, Bidwell's interest extended from agricultural mechanization to transportation. His insistence upon maintaining a racially mixed labor force made his holdings a locus for both inter-ethnic engagement and racial animus. And um, like by that, I mean, so he's got this um, phrase in his diary where he talks about how um, he really prefers not to hire Chinese people who speak good English because the better English Chinese people speak, the more likely they are to talk back to you. And he says, actually, this is a rule that goes for all of the dark races. So there's a kind of interesting moment where the racialization of Chinese, Mexican, African, native peoples all swirling around. He's got all these people working in, um, in his house, which I can show you a picture of, the mansion. Um, and his wife, who is from Washington, DC, the reason we wind up working inside the mansion is she comes from a slave owning DC family and she has what she calls a preference for black household labor. She says, I'd rather have black workers in the house than um, Chinese or Mexicans who can pretend like they don't understand me when I ask them to do something. It's interesting because Bidwell is an abolitionist. He's, he's in favor of abolition. He's anti-slavery. He's in the Congress. He votes for radical reconstruction. He votes for the Civil Rights Act. He votes to impeach the American president. He's going too soft in his opinion on these ex-Confederates, even though Andrew Johnson comes to his wedding. So, like, um, so it's quite interesting because it's a moment where people like Bidwell see no contradiction between the kind of um, feudal, seniorial, almost Southern um, behavior they have toward Native and Mexican workers while maintaining themselves as abolitionists um, at the same time. So I'm gonna um, I'll jump a little bit ahead to say that for Native folks, Bidwell's Ranch is a, a place of both land theft and wage labor refuge from outright murder and a point of departure for a forced removal. It was likewise a place of employment for black, Chinese, Hawaiian, Mexican, and white workers. As a physical space, it reminds us that US capitalism is both global and inherently racial, a system of accumulation that links slavery, violence, imperialism, and genocide, while realizing profit through the production of difference. As with capital, so too with the state. The process is witnessed by John and Henrietta and John Bidwell, indigenous dispossession, Chinese exclusion, and debates over the legal status of Mexican and African-American people would return time and time again to 20th century California, where as Harsha Walia writes, state formation takes place via white supremacy. From segregated classrooms, native boarding schools, to mass incarceration, Japanese internment, through deportations, racist ballot propositions, and police departments famous worldwide for their brutality. These deployments of state power remind us that California Senator James Phelan's slogan, keep California white, was as much a political imperative as a demographic aspiration. Capitalism, racism, and the state shadow the communities whose struggles my book documents. Um, I'm gonna say one last thing about this and we'll move on. I've been talking about Northern California, but this is a Southern California story too. I don't know how many people have been to Los Angeles. Okay, so if you go to downtown LA, there's a Los Angeles street where Los Angeles street is now. And it's pretty much the middle of downtown. Used to be called Calle de los Negros. That's because in the Spanish period, the downtown area was inhabited predominantly by mixed race people, most of whom were various different admixtures of indigenous Spanish and African ancestry. 
when um, white English speaking Americans show up, Calle los Negros becomes N word alley. And this is a place where two important things happen. So we have this physical space that's named after black bodies. It's where native people are um, subject to convict leasing of the kind you see in the American South. So Indian people in this time would be uh, arrested for vagrancy, hired out to an employer, put to work for a week, at the end of the week paid in alcohol, and then arrested for public drunkenness and hired out again. So that's the kind of um, circulation of labor where you have essentially a system of um, neo-enslavement masquerading as a, as a form of wage work. This is also where LA's first Chinatown grows and it's the site of the largest mass lynching in American history, which is the murder of around 20 to 30 Chinese men in 1871. So it's a space of both race making and racial violence, um, which I think is true of California as a whole. So I'm gonna just say that happens in the like rest of this intro that I wanna leap over so we can talk about something else, um, is that I try to kind of make the point that the shadow of this moment of racial violence in California is the production of successive social movements. And so the rest of the book is really framed around these kinds of um, back and forths of social mobilizations against this kind of racial violence. And I wanna take a couple of minutes if that's cool with people to go through one of those. Uh, I'm originally from Venice Beach. Venice Beach has an area called Oakwood in it. This is a historic area that's predominantly African-American, and Mexican-American. It's one of the very few coastal communities in California that's a majority not white. Uh, and its actual origin is that uh, as Santa Monica was built up by people who owned land in the eastern part of Los Angeles, it was um, servant housing for black people who worked in large estates in other parts of, um, of LA. In any event, this is an area that, as I've said, we had a historic black and brown population. You can always tell, um, it's like, it looks like NWA extras, right? Everybody's in all their Raiders gear. This is a photo of some, um, so we have one predominantly black gang called the Venice Shoreline Crips and a predominantly Chicano gang, Mexican-American gang called Venice 13. These two communities, even in their, um, in the street organization incarnation, had always coexisted in this area, right? Um, and you don't start to see the beginning of amnity until after 1992. So for folks who, you know, know a little bit of American history, you'll know, obviously in 1992, you have this mass uprising against police violence, uh, what Mike Davis called the first multi-ethnic bread riot in American history, where Korean American and immigrant Korean communities are positioned as against and um, both threatening and threatened by a mobilized black community, where the largest number of arrestees are um, Latino people, and where there's a kind of um, sharp sense that a political order based around a kind of liberal black mayor and a very conservative, almost fascist white police chief has broken apart. What happens in the early moments of this rebellion period is a drawing together between um, not only the Crips and the Bloods, these two sort of super formations of black street gangs, but Mexican American gangs as well. When I was a young person, I was involved in some of the truce negotiations between some of the different um, Crips and Blood sets. And particularly in Venice, it was a place where you started to see collaboration between Black and Mexican gangs. This was uh, obviously not good for um, the state. And you start to see a pattern emerge by which these communities, which had either been defined by amity or avoidance, are suddenly pushed toward enmity. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why and how that happens and then why and how people responded, and then I'll be done. For those who know a little bit LA, you might know we have a dual policing structure. So that dual policing structure um, includes the Los Angeles Police Department, helpfully identified here by their SS-like black garb, and the LA Sheriff's Department, 
helpfully in brown, like the stormtroopers. Um, they patrol the, the county and they patrol the city. And there's a kind of cultural and organizational difference between them. The Los Angeles Police Department in its modern formation is the creation of a man named William Parker, who was in the Marine Corps, who helped set up the Republic of Korea's National Police after the Korean War, and who was interested in professionalizing the LAPD through technology and through reorganizing the LAPD on the basis of the Marine Corps. So the LAPD are gonna be the first force in the United States to replace revolvers with automatic pistols, to have an organized counterintelligence um, division, to have helicopters, to have automatic rifles, to have hollow point rounds. There's always a kind of drawing together of technological innovation, um, policing and social violence. The sheriffs are cut from a slightly different cloth, right? So this is um, a sheriff's station in East LA, which is a predominantly Spanish speaking area. You can see, because the conquest is never far from mine, Fort Apache, which is a movie and also a kind of um, semiotic symbol of the conquest. It's a police boot as the symbol of the station. And it says in English, the translation in Spanish, always a kick in the ass, basically. Um, and then just for yucks, it says low profile. And keep a little profile. So what happens in these two forces is um, typically because the sheriffs are deployed in Mexican areas and the LAPD are deployed in predominantly black areas. It means even when you have cases of mass mobilization against police violence, they're taking place in one community or the other. So there's a pattern where you have two groups fighting simultaneously, but there are insufficient areas of convergence to produce a lasting formation together. It's impeded by the fact also that the LAPD are extremely interested and practiced in various forms of counterinsurgency. So people know what SWAT teams are, right? The first SWAT team in the United States built in LA to fight against the Panthers. 41 is the street that the Panthers headquarters was on, 41st and Central. This man, Frank Walton, was the commander of the Watts precinct where the Watts Rebellion took place. And this is him in his military uniform. He oversaw US prisons in Vietnam. Um, I can say, what, and then of course there's Daryl Gates with his tank to knock down people's doors. The first job I had was at a community college, so not a university, but kind of like a, almost like a technical school. <laughs> and the history department there was um, part of the social sciences. And we were in there with something called the administration of justice, which is where you go if you want to become a, like a policeman or a prison guard and you need to get a small degree to do it. So my office mate was a guy named Buck Stapleton. And you can tell by the name, that, right? So I'm in there with Buck and Buck was bragging to me about how in the sixties he had gotten to be an infiltrator. And he says, oh, it was so much fun. I got to have a beard, I got to smoke marijuana and if the hippies had a Vietnam protest I got to throw rocks at the guys who I knew from the police academy and then they would attack the crowd and you know he's this guy this is his like you know he's reliving his youth and I said oh well, you're a spy thinking you know death the spies I say you you never felt bad about any of that stuff and he got quiet and he looked at me this is 1997 probably I think I was 24 25 at the time 23 math is bad. And he said, yeah, one time I did do something I felt kind of bad about. He goes, uh, the animal control people called me and they said, Stapleton, get off your ass. And they picked me up and we spent the whole morning driving around the Santa Monica mountains, hiking and picking up rattlesnakes. And we spent the whole afternoon dumping these snakes in people's mail slots. So, you know, I, we have these mail slots where you have a hole that opens in your front door and the mailman puts the mail. So we put these poisonous snakes in the houses of these people we had on a list, anti-war activists, black activists, women's rights activists, all these people. So that was the kind of active counterinsurgency that's happening at the time. It continues, right? This is Bill Bratton, the architect of stop and frisk and so-called broken windows policing. He went from NY, from New York, to the LAPD. This is him in Venezuela. 
uh, with Iman Sedinovitz advising the Caracas police as they prepare a kind of unsuccessful coup attempt against um, Hugo Chavez. So LA has always had this police force and a state apparatus involved in both domestic counterinsurgency and US imperial management. This is a housing project uh, not too far from Venice. And this is one of the epicenters of the emergence of a kind of black brown conflict. Historically, what had happened is there were two entry points here. One was controlled by Mexican American gangs, one was controlled by a black gang. Drugs were sold out of both areas. Um, and there was a kind of circulation of people through. The housing authority closes one of these entrances, which forces both of those sets into um, conflict over that same place. This is 92, 93, which is also a moment where the US goes through a kind of partial post-Cold War reconversion. And there's a moment of mass unemployment in these communities. So mass unemployment, people selling drugs, and the state shaping where those markets are physically going to take place in a way that produces conflict. That conflict spread to and was exacerbated in California prisons, which are booming during this time. Uh, first local jails, like out by Magic Mountain for folks who take their kids to Southern California, and then into the state penitentiary system. And we have lots of evidence of gladiator fights being staged by prison guards, um, and ultimately, there's a move toward racial segregation in the prisons. So it's quite interesting. If you know people who are my age, who did time, maybe a little bit older than me, typically the relationships between black and brown prisoners, not that bad. Going back into the days of George Jackson, the black guerrilla family, there's a kind of radical prison movement in California that's interracial, white as well as brown and black. You go to prison today in California, black prisoners, Mexican prisoners do not associate literally to the level where a Mexican American prisoner cannot sell a phone, drugs, shiv, anything to a black prisoner and vice versa. They have to be white or Asian Americans as go-betweens. So we have an organized state sanctioned, if not directed structure of racial violence and enmity built into the structure of governance. It takes us away from this moment where you can see here Cesar Chavez and Bobby Seale, when Bobby Seale was running for mayor um, of Oakland. And certainly, I want to talk a little bit about the Panthers, and I really will be done. Here, of course, is Huey in the Middle East. Just to say that, for me, the production of racial difference and the navigation of um, <coughs> of relations between these communities of color in the US is really the political key to having a different formation exist in the United States, right? And that we see anti-imperialism and kind of third worldism domestically fusing, particularly in the 60s and 70s moment and persisting in some ways beyond it. So this is a guy named Michael Zinzin. Michael was in the Panthers for the tail end was one of the people who tried to negotiate um, gang truce both in Watts and in South LA. He's also a person who came out of the anti-apartheid struggle and did a lot of work around police violence. He's got one eye because the Pasadena police put his other eye out. Um, and Michael, again, in this 90s moment, is one of the people doing a lot of negotiation around these communities. Another manifestation you see, again, in this time, early to mid-90s and a little bit after, a different presentation of public art in LA around black brown unity. This is a moment where South LA goes from being about 80% black to being about 80% Latino. It's an aside, but if people are interested in Afro-pessimism, we can talk about how the social history of that formation also emerges from this particular moment in California. Um, the guy who painted this mural, Boko Freeman, was one of the founders of the Black Panther Party in Houston. You can see him there in 1970. He comes with the party to LA when the party starts ordering everybody out to the West. Um, and he's involved again in um, this mural production. One of the other people who works on other mural I just showed is a sister named Noni Olabisi. She's passed on now. Younger than Boko, but um, brought up in that same kind of Panther formation. And this is a mural of hers 
in South LA. And boy, did the police not like that one. There she is, um, you can see. Another one of her murals. So she also is one of these people putting up, this is at a high school that had seen a lot of intercommunal violence, a kind of attempt to create a visual um, sense of South LA and other neighborhoods as belonging to both communities. So what you see is a kind of explosion of both direct negotiation, but also cultural production aimed at trying to um, ameliorate and forestall this kind of uh, racial violence. Uh, last couple of people I want to mention is another one who's involved at this time. There's a man named Ron Wilkins. He's called Crook in histories of the 60s. This is him in the Watts Rebellion. It's kind of a famous picture of the um, rebellion. And like Michael Zinzin, Crook has a long political history. He was one of the first, he was the founder of the Community Alert Patrol, which is a police monitoring project that my folks were involved in. And that was where uh, Huey and Bobby got the idea for following the cops around, started in LA, uh, and they took it up to, to the Bay Area. Ron, uh, in this particular moment, it's very interesting. He's very active around Black Brown Unity, writes his children's book, uh, takes a lot of photographs. He's going down into um, Afro Mexican parts of Mexico, trying to bring Black and Latino folks from the States into Mexico. So you see a whole um, moment of this activity. These are two of Ron's images. Um, I love these pictures. And typically what happens, you also start to see art shows, photographic shows, lectures, a whole kind of um, production of a sort of structure of feeling around black and brown unity. Ron took both these and I like, you know, they kind of look like they're shot in the same place or around the same time. This is from 1970, it's Cairo, Illinois. This is South LA in 1992. Um, but, you know, again, the way they're staged and the way the um, girls sit, audiences can see very quickly that there's a commonality there. Um, so Ron is one of these people also comes out of this moment. Uh, Tony Gleaton, another. Tony wasn't a radical man, but he was a Pan-Africanist, a photographer, and he's actually in um, Oaxaca and Guerrero taking a lot of photos of Afro-Descendientes in Mexico and becomes a kind of early person uh, trying to document the links between the African diaspora and Mexico. Um, one of the people he clicks up with, interestingly, in Mexico is a guy named Padre Glenn Jamont, who's a Trinidadian priest who comes out of the Black Power Revolt in Trinidad and goes as a parish priest into this very small town in Mexico and is linking up with these other English speaking Black folks around a project of organizing Mexican Black communities. Um, and that eventually is going to be the seed for this mass movement that exists in Mexico today around constitutional recognition of Mexican um, Afrodescendientes and Interestingly, a couple of years ago, you can see now there's it's a bit of a state project, but also a social movement project. This woman who is dressed in a kind of 19th century dress is a Mascogo. The Mascogo are an indigenous Mexican population. They live in Aquila, close to Texas, and they're descended from Black Americans who fled south instead of north during the time of enslavement. So part of what I try to do in this project is trace um, these kind of overlapping histories of migration, mobilization, struggle, inter-ethnic tension, and the possibilities of other kinds of radical alliances. I talked for a long time, for which I apologize, um, but thanks everyone. And I'm happy to take up any questions um, or objections people might have. Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, or yeah. Uh, you, you want to change up? I mean, I I don't know anybody's name, so I would just be pointing. I don't know anybody's name. We got one. You want to stand behind the camera? Oh, okay. stand behind the camera. You you stand behind the camera. Discipline. We got one here. You want to go for? Okay. What is the that's the question of class, but also what's the construction of this uh, racial difference? That um, I'm sure there has been a. Section of elite who are people of color, or is this all just this um, just concern the working class population? And uh, in that 
what some classes could make the argument that then it, it, it can be also a project of um, of um, fragmenting uh, some kind of a, a uni unifying power of the working class against the edit if one would like to remove that. I love your question and I want to thank you for it. It was something I meant to mention explicitly, but um, in the hour I managed to talk, I didn't say. So um, a specific point from this micro history and then a larger point. The tension between black and Mexican people in Los Angeles is almost entirely located in two class positions, the petty bourgeoisie and what we would call not unproblematically the lumpen. So you see street gangs and you see like um, academics or um, people who work in public sector offices fighting over who will be replacing, for instance, if someone retires or who will hire their, um, a person who looks like them or someone, the no, you know, child of someone they know. So I argue both like in the book and when I stand up in front of people, that if you're looking at the working class, which is the majority of both of these communities, um, the pattern of tension is mostly absent. But if you look at where there are actual expressions of hostility, it tends to be in both of those class positions. Now, the challenge there is that for, um, because the United States is a society where the um, people express their class identities and experience their class identities in many ways through race, there are many people who identify perhaps as middle-class people who are in reality working-class people. And there are people who I would say are lumpen people, but they're not really lumpen people. So they're, they're casually employed or they're part of a reserve army of labor. They're working class people who are only allowed partial entry into the working class, right? Um, so for instance, you know, the, the black unemployment rate in the United States is always at least double the white unemployment rate. We're held as a reserve army of labor. And in fact, in the 19th century, you can see people like Chester Crocker, who's a railroad magnate saying, we need to make sure we're bringing more blacks, Chinese, Mexicans, because white workers have class solidarity and these other groups have neither internal solidarity nor solidarity with workers. And so um, I think it's absolutely the case that certain Groups who experience precarity more readily are more open to entreaties about division, right? Um, the flip side is that cultural production is also emerging from those two class positions, the petty bourgeoisie and the lumpen, whether we're talking about hip hop or things like visual art. So those same class positions that are most susceptible to division are also the ones who can represent a cultural convergence that produces what in the United States would pass for a proletarian consciousness. I'm making air quotes because these are terms that are not used politically in the United States, right? Where um, if you explain to people what a program of socialism is, they say, I support that. If you say, well, that's socialism, suddenly they're, they're like, they run away, they're very afraid. So does that speak to the question? But I really appreciate it. It's a really important question. Thanks for your talk, Daniel. Uh, uh, you, you made like a, a review from the 19th century until the beginning of the 90s, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you think that like new liberalism, like understanding the liberal, like uh, I think you've, uh, as a Marxist, I guess you follow the, the ideas of the ideology. Uh, so like, uh, how does it impact this, this sexual racism in the U.S.? Neoliberalism, more generally. Yeah, I mean, I think um, also a very important question, and like uh, wave your hand if I start to give like too long of an answer and the sun begins to rise, having just gone down. Um, <clears throat> so I think 
that what happens concretely in the United States is that neoliberalism arrives at the moment where the working class, where Black and Latino workers begin to make grounds in terms of um, factory employment and these kinds of things. Happens some in the 1940s, but the reconversion is very quick. And it's really the 60s and 70s, early 70s, you begin to see those gains. And of course, that's the moment that neoliberalism is going to begin. But one of the things you see, for instance, in across California, is a mass mobilization against the closure of industrial plants. So Edward Soja and some of these people talked about economic restructuring. That's happening as a mass movement is is trying to push for the retention of an industrial policy, which will allow um, a kind of stable life for working people. So, you know, when neoliberalism comes in, it produces um, precarity and anxiety. And that is, of course, going to produce uh, socialized violence. So um, that's a kind of a backdrop. But I think that uh, the actual operation of capitalism in the United States for non-white people is often indistinguishable from some of the forms of precarity that we associate specifically as coming in after 1980, if that makes sense. So I think it's possible to, um, it, it's, it's important to use the analytic because it corresponds to the predominant formation after the mid 1970s, but it's also important to understand the lived experience of working people means that, I mean, I'll give you an example. In my first book, there's a chapter that has three films in it. The first film is an avant-garde black film um, called Killer of Sheep, where this black worker works in a slaughterhouse and he's extremely alienated killing these animals, all, maybe you know it, by Charles Burnett. He's just murdering sheep all day. So it's a kind of classic proletarian alienation. The second film is called Bless Their Little Hearts. And it's got a, the protagonist is a black man who is like a scavenger who goes through the streets and just picks and sells things, right? The third film is Menace to Society, which is shot in a housing project where my father grew up, Jordan Downs and Watts. And the protagonist is gang member. No work, no work to be seen. So then we have to say, though, this same neighborhood across an arc of 35 years, alienation is alienation, right? Viol socialized violence is socialized violence. So I think it's possible to speak um, sometimes of phases of capitalism, neoliberalism, neocolonialism, when it's okay just, I think, to retain the language of imperialism, capitalism in the first place, if that makes sense. I wasn't too um, happy with my own choice to use the term racial capitalism for that reason in my work, because I think it's redundant. If the whole argument of the chapter is that American capitalism is racialized, you shouldn't need to say racial capitalism. But sometimes you have to throw to the reader, you know, thing you put in the water to, yes, you know, so that's, that's part of the tactical choice that gets me. Você ah, brasileiro. Okay, so that guy, Michael Zinzen, I showed. Also, we had a large project with some folks in Belo Horizonte and also um, in Rio de Janeiro and um, Mangueira and a couple of other places, some similar truce negotiations and kind of transnational um, social organizing of of gangs, so it's, we have a reciprocal relationship to some folks there. Happy to answer any other. Please. And can I ask something uh, more about the political political interactions between different groups, ethnic groups, too? Um, especially at, at the end of your talk, you showed us pictures which were quite telling about this uh, attempt to take together different cultures, different uh, ethnic uh, mm -hmm. belongings, let's say, 
Uh, and I was quite, uh, quite struck by the uh, from Spanish translation of uh, Marcus Garvey book. Oh, yes. Uh, in which race, the original race, is translated with people. Yes. Uh, it's a book. It's reminding me about what we trying to do here in the region, uh, inquiring the political organization around race. Uh, black began to signify the unity of different struggles. Uh, motivation struggle, say. Is there something similar uh, in terms of languages uh, and attempt of organizing this unity that you showed us? Or Yeah, so I think um, this is also a great question. There is a moment of, let's say, political Blackness in the United States, but it's not named as such that takes place earlier, right? So there's a moment where I think when the Panthers, for instance, speak of themselves as the vanguard of the revolution, they're articulating a vision of political blackness because what they're saying is every aggrieved population in this society can find its political expression under the banner of our leadership. So they're centralizing black leadership, right? They're saying it's an access point for gay and lesbian people, American Indians. Now that's not without problem at the time, right? So in the Native community, for instance, you'll find some people who say, like Vine Deloria Jr., at the same time, he says, civil rights is not useful for American Indian people at all, because it's all about being in this place that we want to be out of. But Black power is extremely useful for us, because it's a language of self-determination. And that gives Indian people, as they said then, an ability to articulate and chart our own path. So one of the things that's very poorly understood in the history of the United States, because so many scholars are politically liberal people, is that the influence of black power is far more profound than the influence of so-called civil rights. You can trouble the border between them. There's some activism like parents activism in school and stuff that's anti-discrimination, it's nonviolent. It seems like civil rights. But to the extent that it's grounded in an articulation of the dignity and, um, and, and demands of working class black communities, it's black power rather than civil rights. So in the earlier moment, before kind of 70s, 80s moment in the US, I think we have a language. Now, in terms of the organizing of Afrodescendientes in Latin America today, there's definitely a relevance for that earlier language of political blackness. Because what you find in Colombia and Brazil in, in parts of Mexico is that the convergence around indigenous and black communal organizing is one where, um, for instance, black communities are sometimes recognized legally as having the status that indigenous communities have, right? In the sense that they have a a right to collective land ownership constitutionally recognized that they enter through saying, well, we're a people, we're not just Colombians and people in this constitution have rights if they're communities. And so I think we, again, there's a way to think about the structural language of political blackness in ways that are very useful in different contexts and sites. In terms of the specific case study that I gave today, I would say um, the Afro-Mexican, portrayal of Afro-Mexican people to both Black and Mexican audiences was about explaining to Black Americans that there were Mexican people who were African descent, which is not something that was well known. And within the Mexican community that Mexico had a black population, which was equally something that was not well known. So it was sort of at the stage before you could have the kind of articulation that Simonon and other folks talked about. I will say, though, there's a couple of shadow quotes, paraphrasing of um, Simonon in the introduction to the book. And I personally find that language of political blackness um, very valuable. Oh, and then, sorry, the language thing. It's super interesting, right? Because similarly, when you start talking about Encuentros de Pueblos Negros, 
Pueblo has a dual meaning there too, right? It's like physically they're villages, but it's also people. So I think um, the linguistic element in politics becomes quite interesting. And then as a scholar, you're looking for specificity. As an organizer, you're producing ambiguity. And so sometimes I think that also can be in a, a tension when you're trying to figure out what people meant and what they were doing. Sir. I've got some questions. Uh oh. Uh, so I want to think about how, like in some ways, because your talk, start of the talk shows you that the US is not itself a, it's a construction, right? Like it's a fake reality, as all states are, but this one's really fake and fake, yeah, as all settler colonies are. And so is there something in the, the, the kind of radical unity that comes out of California, which is not as sellable across the US? Because I'm thinking here the Panthers, right? And I give you a good, good story. Like my uncle lives in San Francisco. And so when I go and visit, he goes, oh, let's go drive around here because it reminds me of Fiji. Right? Because there are different ethnicities everywhere. Mm -hmm. They're hanging out. It's Oakland, right? Yep. But there is something distinct about Oakland, which is not in itself, and California, that is not kind of transferable to the rest of the US and the way it's formed across mm -hmm. race and class, right? And that radical unity becomes, if you look at the history of the Panthers, it becomes problematic to sell in other places, yes. right? You know, you think of like the black nationalism of the New York chapter, vis a vis what is this kind of, you know? It's yeah, why, why are you Daruba bin Wahad yeah, exactly. and Asada Shakur? Yeah, exactly, yeah. right? And, you know, and then Asada Shakur says, well, you don't know, you, you along the West Side don't know yourselves. Yes. How can you lead us if you don't know us, right? Um, so is there something in that? And then when you talk about the transference of that into class politics, is some way California, that radical solidarity is that I always think of the Panthers as being like maybe 40, 50 years too early, right? Yes. Like they're there, they're saying stuff. You know, Newton gives talks and says, like, at some point, we, we might not want to call ourselves the Black Panthers. Can you imagine saying that? So, <clears throat> is there something about California that then creates a form of radical unity that cannot be sold across the rest of the country, even though it should be, right? And then the second question is interesting about. Just this week, there was this big statistical release by the FT guy with the numbers about how, in a sense, the radical unity now between minorities in the US is actually around conservative voters who are turning more traditionally to the Republican Party vis-a-vis -vis the Democrats, right? And, yeah. and look, the Democrats are underlying the genocide, so that might be followers if you believe it. But, you know, is, in a sense, the state stop that radical left unity, right? Yeah. You know, and that, that kind of dovetails what you're saying. Like now the unity can be found on the right where you can amount black and brown conservatives. But on the left, you know, because of the way you have to organize the lump and right. you have to, it's more difficult now, right? Because the state has intervened like that. Yeah, so these, yeah. So like <laughs> both very important questions. To take the second one first um, in two parts. First of all, I don't really believe what, is being published about the turn of yeah. these communities to the right because there's no attempt to disaggregate um, Venezuelans, Cuban Americans, um, even so. There's multiple categories of people coming from Latin America. Some are specific. They're not. Some are political exiles from left-wing projects. Of course, they're not going to vote for the Democratic Party. Some are um, economic migrants fleeing the destruction that we've visited on um, Central America, the Caribbean, and South America, uh, and a deliberate project to destabilize the left in Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, all these places, right? So they are leaving an experiment that has been strangled, and it's no wonder, right? Um, but I also think that there is a uneven media scape in the United States where the right is much more powerful in terms of um, its certain form of its messaging. But I think with black folks, uh, to the extent that there are black people in the states who may be voting Republican, again, we have to pull back and say, Donald Trump has a really specific appeal around maleness and a particular kind of masculinity that spikes at moments of um, 
class anxiety. And I think that some of the cultural production that we saw in the Black community in the 80s, which reflected that in the 1970s, there was a beginning. I mean, Black North Americans in the United States are the only population where male and female earnings are, approach parity. So there is a there is an underappreciated and under-theorized question of gender relations at the heart of whether people are skewing toward the right politically or not, right? Because they're in a space where at times there's economic parity and that produces male anxiety in a patriarchal society. So I think most of the black folks you find moving toward the Republican party, if they're at the lower class levels, that's part of the explanation. It's also driving the popularity of this buffoon. Whether these people stay tethered to that Republican party when he eventually exits the stage, assuming that happens and we don't have a new maximum leader, um, I'll be very surprised. The Republican party, I also think some of those essays or some of those that political messaging is about trying to rein in its more and more crass appeals toward a certain kind of whiteness. Its base resists that. So, you know, watch that space. California exceptionalism, absolutely. I gave a version of this talk um, elsewhere and I was asked by a New Yorker, like, well, what about New York? And I said, the strength and problem of black radicalism is in New York is that New York is a multinational black space. So um, black radicalism in New York will manifest through languages of the black Atlantic, Pan-Africanism, um, and the relationship of black North Americans to the Caribbean, the continent, um, black European communities in a way that I think meant for instance, that the, the link between black and Puerto Rican radicalism in 1960s era New York was referenced through a common point in the African diaspora in a way that's different with the Red Guards and the Brown Berets and these other formations. So I think that, as you said, in the way that if we'd had the politics then with the demographics we have today, we would have different possibilities than we had at the moment. The racial formation that existed in California in the 1960s is increasingly the racial formation that exists in the United States as a whole. So I think that gives us some possibilities, but the languages that were spoken in that day um, are not necessarily languages that people, that resonate with people today. That's why I chose to deliberately engage a political language that came from an earlier moment. I could have come up with some term, I suppose, if I were more creative. I'm interested to see what, if any, resonance um, this notion of unity across these forms of difference has when tethered to a moment that had a revolutionary possibility. Well, we got a question at home. Uh, Owen, do you want to just unmute and ask a question? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's been super interesting. Uh, we're, I think we're actually working on some some similar themes. I've got a book project myself that uh, I'd like to email you about, actually. Please and do. one of the things that I've come across uh, or, or like had to contend with is precisely about Afro pessimism, and you mentioned it in passing, and you seem to indicate that you had some thoughts, and I'd like to hear what they are. Oh man, see, you guys are the best. Everybody's asking me those things. Yeah, okay, so um, <clears throat> let me just say really quickly something about that. Afro pessimism, let me give you a mater my materialist take on it. Afro pessimism emerges in California during the 1990s. That's a moment that's shaped <laughs> one by the demographic transition of these neighborhoods from black to brown, two, the elimination of affirmative action in US universities, and three, the wide, the significant growth of um, Mexican American and Asian American people into those universities. So what that means structurally is that um, black folks have a sense of loss of neighborhood, loss of positionality within the institutions. Um, and the people, it's not an accident that some of the people who we come to time and time again, Wilderson, Sexton, uh, Saidia, they're at Berkeley in the 1990s at this particular moment. So Eula Taylor has a great piece about the history of African-American studies at Berkeley. What happened there is that 
Black Studies was part of a third world liberation front. And they said, we will not take departmental status with all the resources, PhD program, all this other stuff, unless everybody gets a department. The left was purged at state and at Berkeley. Black folks were given a department and the native and Latino and Asian American folks existed at these lower level of programs. When the worm turned as it does, then the, the physical jobs were removed from black studies and farmed out to these other organizations. And that political reality was turned into a conceptual and philosophical um, idea about the permanent perennial status of black folks. I have my issues with Paul Gilroy, but when he says it's like four people in California, why do we have to react to all that? He's not wrong. I think the other element there, um, though that's worth saying, is that, so in the intro, I have like a really crabby attack on Afro-pessimism and a parallel crabby attack on a vision of settler colonial studies that can't make provision for the existence of black folks. I think that this comes back to the brother's question about neoliberalism. These are political and intellectual fads that arise in a moment where um, people are responding in ways to precarity by trying to distinguish themselves and their particularistic claims of aggrievement. To paraphrase Huey, you know, I see no essential difference between someone who has to flee a US-backed dictatorship in Manila or Guatemala City and somebody who lives under police occupation in East LA or South LA. I mean, of course there's difference, but at the end of the day, the political question is whether people find utility in that difference or in the efforts to bridge that difference. Um, and I think that's very much where I, where I would place that um, Afro-pessimist um, trend, which in my introduction, I call pork chop pessimism. So that tells you where I'm at. Sir, please, Diego, Diego. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe just a quick question, if you could tell us a bit more about multi-ethnic um, solidarity, more concretely in the labor movement. I mean, you mentioned Julio Cesar Chavez briefly, and obviously there's a whole context of the National Farm Workers Union in the 60s and 70s, but also about like the most most recent wave of labor activism and trade unions in the US. Yeah, so for sure. So, I mean, if you go historically into the 1930s and 40s, we're talking about the Congress of Industrial Organizations and the CIO, which comes out of that sort of popular front <laughs> moment and is tied very openly to uh, racial justice formations, Committee for the Defense of the Foreign Born, El Congreso de Gente Habla Español, um, the Civil Rights Congress, all of those formations. So at the moment where the labor movement has the greatest density, in a kind of multi-ethnic way. And this is not just true in California, but it's true other places throughout the US. It's tied directly to questions of racial justice. So if you theorize from there that the success for US labor is partially a question of the extent to which it directly engages rather than elides or tries to ignore questions of racial justice, then the place we would expect to see the greatest dynamism in labor today would be among those people whose work is most centrally tied to questions of racial justice, but who are increasingly experiencing economic precarity, education. So for me, it's no surprise that you look at Chicago, you look at um, places where they have right to work laws or California or even New York. Teachers unions are one of the, I mean, Amazon and the private sector is critical for the long-term rebuilding of an organized left and a labor movement. But the place where you've seen the cadre emerging from, and a lot of the people who wind up, you know, as young staff people in some of the private sector struggles that are taking place and unions where the language of class struggle and racial justice can be introduced and there can flow from there into automobile industry or lithium plants or other kinds of industries is the teachers. And that's where we see the, the labor movement um, articulating itself most clearly. Now, there's also some advantages, of course, it's harder to break public sector unions. There's some protections. They're tied more directly to democratic establishments that, that need their support. 
Um, so the, there's some subjective conditions that facilitate that as well. But by and large, the argument would be you cannot succeed politically in the United States if your goal is to impose a notion of class that is divorced from the reality of race, which is to say that it's fine to have a model of base and superstructure, but the superstructure has to extend into the base and the base has to come from, you know, beyond the foundation, right? That, that it's not something that sits loosely on top and can be pushed aside easily. It's more like a Lego, you know, it's stuck together. Um, so I think that's how I would see that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we have any more? No, we don't have any more. Maybe somebody at home. No, I don't think so. All right. Thank you all very much in person and um, at home. I'm very grateful. Oh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thanks so Take off the cancel the recording. Yeah. Bye to everyone at home. We're back on the 27th of March. Wednesday for our next public seminar, which is the left ecology and degrowth, um, which has a number of great scholars attached to it. Um, 